Hi everyone. I'm Molly Garfinkel, Managing Director at City Lore, a Lower East Side based cultural conservation and education nonprofit. Since 1985, City Lore has documented, presented, and advocated for New York City's grassroots cultures to ensure their living legacy in stories and histories, places and traditions. Thank you for joining us for tonight's installment of Tell Me a Story, a City Lore Salon with host Annie Lanzalato and special guest Valerie Reyes Jimenez. Tonight, we're focusing some attention on a groundbreaking news item from 40 years ago. 2021 marks 40 years since the New York Times published an article headlined, Rare Cancer Seen in 41 Homosexuals. The piece, which was published on July 3rd, 1981, announced to the world the presence and proliferation of what would become known as the HIV AIDS epidemic. This evening, we have the privilege of hearing from Valerie, an AIDS activist, long-term HIV or human immunodeficiency virus survivor and community organizer. Valerie is the associate for New York City Community Mobilization at Housing Works, the 31-year-old nonprofit dedicated to fighting AIDS and homelessness. She's also a 2021 Marshall England Memorial Public Health Awardee. In 2005, Valerie was the New York City coordinator of the Campaign to End AIDS, a caravan of AIDS activists who marched from the Lincoln Tunnel to the Lincoln Memorial and did street actions along the way over the course of 21 days. Valerie was born and raised on the Lower East Side, just a few blocks from City Lore. She's a formidable New Yorkan mother and grandmother, and she is thriving. Her story is one that we hope gives you hope and the courage to keep moving forward and fighting for a better world 40 years from now. For those of you who may not know, the hallmark of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS, is a progressive depletion of T cells. Over the last three decades, Valerie has counted T cells, the vital white blood cells that help our bodies fight infection. She has also counted the friends, loved ones, neighbors, and fellow activists who have passed from AIDS-related complications. She has fought every day to make sure that women who were and continue to be largely ignored in HIV and AIDS research, treatment, and advocacy have been considered, cared for, and counted in the narratives around HIV, AIDS, and community activism. Annie and Valerie met at Housing Works in 1991, the year after Keith Kyler, Charles King, Eric Sawyer, and Virginia Schubert, four members of the AIDS activist group AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP, founded Housing Works to serve one of New York City's most neglected populations, the tens of thousands of unhoused men, women, and children in New York City living with HIV and AIDS. The activists called their new group Housing Works because they believed that stable housing was the key to helping HIV positive people live healthy and fulfilling lives and to prevent further spread of the virus. Annie joined ACT UP in 1987 while she was in remission with Hodgkin's disease. In 1991, she was hired at Housing Works as the literacy coordinator in the job training program. There she created a, a writing workshop, which Valerie took called Autobiography as a Tool of Resistance. Annie and Valerie are the only two survivors from that workshop. They've both, been, they've both buried many peers and been navigating health challenges their whole adult lives. Their, their friendship is a source of strength and understanding for each other, and that's been magnified during COVID-19. Uh, and now I'd like to call Annie into the room. Hey, Annie, Annie, are you there? Hey, I'm over here on my corner. Hey, Annie, nice to see you. You look great. Yeah, yeah you know, I'm on my corner because I can't, I still am sheltering in place. Literally. Yeah, it's probably a good idea for a little bit longer, at least. We just don't know what's going well, on. Well, you know, immunocompromised. I mean, it's like I'm still scared out there. I went to Brooklyn once yesterday, or the other day, was it yesterday, no. to see my niece, and I was... I was really panicked in the street, I gotta say. Yeah, you gotta take a take a second and space. All right, throw me the ball, throw me the ball. All right, Annie, ready? I'm gonna nice and easy, easy this time. All right. All right. All right. But like, just. Got it. Got two it, finger, all right. Two finger catch. Right on. That's a hallmark of a street kid. Nice. All right, listen, let's feed the meter. We got an hour, then these people got other things to do, I'm sure. Okay. You got a quarter? Uh, you got a quarter? Yeah, here go. All right, thanks. Okay. Thanks. I could even borrow money virtually. It's a very good skill. I've got more if you need it. All right, let's feed this meter. And uh, uh, thank you for giving me one more hour alive with 
Valerie, one of my favorite people on earth. Who knew we would have uh, 40 years together? All right, Molly, I'll see you later. Valerie, get ready. Get ready for a big catch. I'm gonna, you wanna pop fly, Val, or you wanna, you want me to roll it easy? Where are you? I don't see, I don't hear you. There she is. There I am. You want it high up or you want it low? How do you uh, want it? Do, 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 pop. Wait, I can't hear you. Let me test your microphone. Hello, hello. Bro, no, it's bro. off. It's off. Press the button. I don't know. Oh, that's good. There you go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to roll. It was working a minute ago. Come on. Do I'm it. Ready? Roll it. Yeah, I'm gonna roll it. Nice come on, and come easy. Come on, get, go for it. Here it comes. Ah! <laughs> oh, my God. What the hell? That's a big Spaldine you got, Mama. What it is got that? got bigger. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know. Do you believe it's been it's 40 years, 30 years since I, that we know each other? It's no, <laughs> I, I mean, can't believe it. You know, in 1991, would you have thought that we would have survived to 2021? That wasn't even a thought in my head. There was no way I was, I was just trying to get to the year 2000. Well, we got, we got an hour cause the meat is fed. So we got this hour and just to, you know, listen in the room tonight, I see we have people who know everything, people who have fought on the front lines their whole adult lives. We got Jim Igo, we got IVRs, we got, yeah, we got a lot of people. And then we got people who maybe never thought of AIDS. Maybe it was never a concern. Right. So let's, what about we start showing some archival video of you when you're strutting around the uh, East Village? <laughs> set, up, set up the cliff. Tell us uh, what we're going to see. All right. So this clip is pretty much like a time capsule for me. It's uh, something we did in the mid nineties or on 1995 or so. Um, it was an MTV special. And um, for me, it was more like leaving something for my kids so that when I did die, they had something to look back on because they were still so young and, and small. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what we're going to take a quick look at then. And then we'll talk about what's happening now. My mother on Mother's Day, 1981, I love you, Yeah, you gave me this book for Mother's Day. Me? Mm -hmm. Yep, the little kid one. My name is Valerie Reyes Jimenez. I'm 30 years old. I'm the mother of two children. My daughter, Haiti, she'll be 12 in a few. And my son, Joseph, he's seven. A lot of people just by looking at me probably wouldn't know that I'm HIV positive or that I have full-blown AIDS. But um, I do, and... Um, and it hasn't been easy. Mm, that's Joseph in my tummy. I'm gonna have a Jimmy. You already were born yet, you remember? Mommy. After the birth of my son in 1988, I decided to get tested. My husband was waiting for me downstairs and I told him, and this lady just finished telling me that I was positive, that I have HIV, and he started to cry. And that really puzzled me because it was like, what are you crying about? I'm the one with the virus here. And um, the reason that he was crying was because he felt that he had infected me. We went and we both got tested together and we both came back positive. I remember praying, getting on my hands and knees and praying to God that, you know, the kids didn't have it. And you know, by the grace of God, they both came back negative. I, I think that alone, help me go through my process with my husband. You know, that, that was the first day of school. Mm -hmm. Papi died, right? That was the same morning that um, your father died. Uh, what did I say? It says, Papo. He says, we love you. We'll miss you. Born March 28th, 1953. And it says, died September 9th, 1992. You remember, you Let's remember. Start. It was dark. Yeah, it was dark. Do, 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 do. 
I don't think that most people understand that living with this disease hurts. That journey that Valerie made, that's an incredible journey. But that journey is a journey that millions of people living with this disease have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of us make the choice not only to live, but we make the choice to fight for other people and to continue that fight. I'm here to demand that our governor pay attention to us. Uh, if he doesn't know what's going on, I invite him to come down here and see this for himself. One of the most important things is that I'm not dying from this disease, I'm living with this disease, and I'm definitely living today versus a few years ago when I was just merely existing. But what helped me get through it all was housing works and the people that were dealing with me in my case. Good, how are the kids? They're all right. It's yeah. been a while. Oh Have God. a seat. Nice. When Valerie first came into Housing Works, she was living with her mother um, and some other family members with her family. They were living doubled up. That was what they called, uh, quote unquote, the hidden homeless. Oh, my sister. My mother, my brother, my sister, my uncle, my kids, my husband, and myself were all under the same roof. And it was really difficult because we were li literally like living on top of one another. When I first got to Housing Works, I guess I was pretty lucky. I walked in through their doors in August, and by October, I was already housed. Oh, home sweet home. I remember coming into Housing Works and hearing the word grassroots a lot and not really understanding what that meant. But as time went by, you know, I came to realize that everyone is entitled to the simple things of life, which are basically housing, food, you know, and, and the right to live and to, you know, to live and to let live. Right now in New York City, we're having a lot of problems as far as the budget cuts and all that. One thing in particular that will be affecting me, affecting countless thousands of other people, is the cutting of the home health care services. So the other day I found myself giving testimony at a um, town hall meeting. I'm a 30-year-old HIV positive mother of two, and I have been using these services for the past two years. And I'm here today by the grace of God. Today is a good day for me and I'm able to be here. But there are days when I cannot get up from my bed to do the simplest things that I need to do to take care of my children. You need to pick up those books on the floor and put them away. I really believe that the reason that I'm alive and I'm doing you know, as well as I'm doing is because of my kids. You don't have any connections with Con Ed, do you? Like a lot of the times I don't have the energy to keep up with them, but I, I do my best and I think we're pretty close, and we do have some really good times together. For Haiti's 12th birthday, we had this little party for her, and um, I don't know how I got myself into that situation, but I had like 14 girls, pre-teenage to teenagers, come over. Oh my God, it's again. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna survive this. <laughs> girls that were there, they were definitely enjoying themselves. They were at a, a stage now where they're finding out about their own bodies, their sexuality. If you are that kind of man, cause I'm that kind of girl. Being that my daughter is 12 years old now and she's at that point where she's getting phone calls from boys and she's getting interested. Hello? Brings me yeah. back to when I was 12 and 13 years old. I remember it well. <laughs> Wow, Jesus. Woo. So we saw Keith Silar, who was my boss and your beloved friend, and um, we honor him tonight. We lost Keith many years ago. All right, Val, uh, let's dive in. Um, what would you whisper into your young year, 30 mother or two at that town hall meetings? I, I would say, you know, sweetheart, don't worry, too, don't, don't, don't get too serious. It's gonna be all right. You're gonna be around a whole lot longer than you think you are. You know, um, you're gonna do good and the kids are gonna be well. You're gonna raise them and you're gonna do a good job. Where are your kids now? And you have a granddaughter, right? Tell us I where they are. Oh, oh my gosh. She was, my daughter was turning 12 in that video and it kind of kicked up some stuff and whatnot, right? And um, 
She's 38 now, and my son is 33. Um, he is on a ship. He's a merchant marine. He's currently somewhere in the Red Sea. Hopefully, he's gotten through the, you know, Africa where it's like not too uh, safe to be at. And uh, my daughter is a school teacher. She teaches in, uh, shout out to Bronx Latin, all right, high school out in the Bronx. So um, yeah, she, she's a teacher. And, you know, I, my granddaughter, geez, she's 18. You know, I, I, she's phenomenal, man. She's, I, I never imagined myself being a grandmother. It wasn't something that I even thought was going to happen for me. You know, I only thought my, my dream was to, to be a grandma, I mean, to be a mother and to raise my kids. You know, that's really all I wanted to do when I was younger, you know, and, and maybe grow up to be a firewoman or something. And um, that, that didn't happen. Actually, you can go on Google now, you Google firewoman, it doesn't even come up, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. You know, it's the kind of world we live in. Don't, do don't get me started on Google. If you put in uh, Google Translate motherland into Italian, uh -huh. you wanna put your head through the wall with what it tells you. I'll just give you a hint. It, it comes up with a patriarchal definition. Let's get back to you. Don't of get me course, started. Of course. Listen, um, Val, oh, let me yeah. say to everyone out there, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, we, we will open it up. We'll do a Q&A and open mic. If anyone wants to come on, please come on, put your name in the chat. And um, Eva or Mackenzie, and Eva, thank you for popping Valerie's family photo up, photo up right on time. Thank you, Eva. So just put your name in the chat. Um, we see some of you out there. We have, yeah, we have you, Jesus, great. And, uh, or if you don't wanna be seen, that's fine. If you have a question, throw it in the chat. So um, Val, there's so much, so much to talk about. Um, let's do this. That video ended, you were talking about puberty. What was it like being you? You grew up on Third Street, puberty hits. Take us back to, 1979, 1980, whatever year it is. Take us back to third. I'll, 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 I'll just say on the record, you know, hormones really suck, man. You know, when they, when, you, when they come in and they kick in, they're just like, whoa. And even when you're older, like my age, hormones still suck. <laughs> just don't have enough hormones anymore. You know, so regardless, hormones rules our lives, you know. And um, as, a, as a kid, you know, um, coming of age and, and, noticing that my body was changing was something that I wasn't really happy about one. And um, knowing that my life was starting to change, you know, uh, Puerto Ricans have a thing, you know, when a, when a woman begins to menstruate, it's, uh, well, when a girl, because you're still pretty young, when a girl begins to menstruate, you're no longer just that little girl. And, you know, el gallo canto, that means, you know, the, the rooster has sung. And once that rooster sings, you know, forget it, it's a wrap. Your life is about to change. You know, everybody calls everybody the titis and the aunts and the cousins, and everybody knows, you know, that rite of passage has, has occurred, you know? And um, I mean, look, human beings are sexual. That's the nature of the beast. It's what it is. You know, the whole idea is to procreate and to, you know, get the next generation on. And that goes for any species of animal, pretty much that's on this planet, right? But um, you know, growing up on the Lower East Side, you know, we were kind of sheltered. We were, my, my parents were working, they were doing the best that they could for us. And um, I got to that stage in my life where, you know, it was all about the boys and all about hanging out and doing things. And by the time I was 16, I met the kid's father. And I didn't know then that he was gonna be like the person for me, but it turned out to be that way, you know? Um, you're gonna see behind me, there's some candles and a picture and, and things there. Today makes 29 years that he passed away. And, you know, he was like the first person that I had in, you know, that, that died and I was holding him, you know, when, as he took his last breaths and stuff. So, you know, although I had seen bodies on the street and I seen people die and, and I saw people in their coffins, he was the first one that actually died in my arms, you know? And um, that's, uh, that was something that I'll, you know, I, I'll never forget that, you know, he, he was the first, but not the last, let's just put it that way, right? And um, you know, being with him, I, I knew that he, he was, I was 16, he was 28 years old. And um, 
you know, he had already gone to jail. He had been in the streets, you know, fast life, you know, fast cars, easy money, uh, you know, that, that kind of lifestyle. That was something that really uh, attracted me. So you know, went there and I was with him um, up until the day that he died. So from 16 to 27, we stayed together. We had two children in the process. Um, we even uh, tried to, to retire from, from doing, uh, you know, what was then in the 80s considered what most people, what, what, what many people did back then in the day was, you know, there was a lot of drugs and stuff in the street. So we were involved in some of that and uh, we decided to just, you know, to go away and do something a little different. And, and we did that. Um, but What'd you do? Where'd you go? We went to Puerto Rico. We kind of, you know, I, I threw my bags out the window. So that building where I said, oh, my sister, that my mother still lives in that building. Like, we, like that's where I grew up. I grew up across the street from the New York Rican Cafe. And that's my neighborhood. I left claw marks. You'll see it all over Los Saida. You know, when, when I left there to come to the Upper West Side, I'm still in Manhattan, but, you know, anyway. But, um, yeah, I threw my, my clothes out the window. And, and then uh, I told my mom I was going to the store. And I just didn't come back. <laughs> so... So who was downstairs to catch your clothes? My sister-in-law. Were they in a bag or you just threw them out? What'd you no, do? I had them in a bag. I packed them, you know, and I tossed them out the window. She caught them. Sorry, Goldie, I'm blowing up the spot. I don't think too many people knew that, but. Uh, yeah. Is that why your mother gave you that nickname? She told me so. <laughs> so everybody, for one of these writing workshops, Val brought her mom, Merta, and, and Merta told me Valerie's nickname is You Can't Catch the Wind. Yeah, she she has always said that um, that's pretty much would that would be my my Taino Indian name. Uh, you, you can't catch the wind because she she always told me that I was such a force that you know I, I could be soft and gentle or I can be as fierce as the wind as a hurricane. You know, so um, she says that's like your name. It's perfect for you. It's 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 who you are. And, you know, no matter what we do as a, as a society, as a people, we try our best to, to use the, the force of the wind to power our houses or do whatever. But the bottom line is you can never catch the wind, you know, and the wind is fierce, as we found out not too long ago, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's getting fiercer, it looks like. So, yeah. So you go to Puerto Rico and yeah. tell us how you got diagnosed. How hard was it for a woman to get diagnosed? In so we, we, we figured... Years? Yeah, we, we figured that we were okay. You know, a lot of the, a lot of our friends that, you know, we had associated with were already passing away from HIV and AIDS. Although nobody ever said anything at that time. Everyone was just dying of, you know, cancer. People had liver cancer, they had this, or they died from that. But nobody ever acknowledged the fact that they had cancer. And back then, um, we, we used to say, oh my goodness, so-and-so, you know, they've got the look, they've got the monster, right? And um, whew, anyway. Fast forward, it's like 1989 and I kept, you know, like for years already, I had been getting like yeast infections and I had been getting like this rash and it was just like, uh, like this, it was just so cruel. Just like my, you would look at me sideways and I'd get a freaking yeast infection. It was just like that, right? And um, I kept going to the doctors, getting treated. I would get, I would get like a hangnail and my whole finger would get swollen. I would get like a, a you shave your bikini line and get a, a thing, this thing I know it's like, it's taken over my thigh, you know, that, that kind of infection and stuff. So this was happening for years. And I finally went and I told the, um, the nurse one day, I was like, listen, just test me for HIV. You know, I knew about it because I had an uncle who also had the virus. And, um, you know, I, I like to kind of think that I knew a little bit of, you know, how you can get it, how you can't get it. And, and stuff like that. And I knew that it wasn't only affecting people with HIV, uh, the people who, men who had sex with men, because they were also, uh, you know, people who were using drugs and, and then their partners. So, you know, as the years went on, we started learning a little more and a little more. And um, in 1989, I went, I got tested and it came back positive. And when I told uh, the kid's father, I think I, in the video, it said it, you know, that he started to cry. And I'm like, well, what are you crying about? You know? And it turned out that it was, you know, he goes, well, if you have it, I have it, you know, and, and I just felt that no matter what was going to happen, that as long as the kids were going to be, you know, the, the, the kids came back negative, that I'd be able to handle whatever came my way, you know, and, um, 
and I did that. But, you know, still in all, back then, every every doctor that I saw, you know, because once I found out I was positive, we, we sold our stuff, we packed up, we came back to New York because we knew that in Puerto Rico, there was no way in hell we were going to be able to get any kind of like proper health care. And there, there were people protesting. Matter of fact, the same week that I found that I was positive, there were people protesting and uh, they were saying that, you know, to kind of like, they wanted to isolate people who were HIV positive. Like, yeah, let's put them away on, on the island. Let's, let's, you know, put the money, just get them out. And mosquitoes that bite people with HIV will pass it on to you. So, so a mosquito bites me and then it goes and bites you, you're gonna get HIV that way. You know, so that was like the belief um, then. And uh, it, it was just something that was, you know, I knew it was, I was very frustrated. I ended up back in my mother's house and that's kind of like where this video kind of picked up, you know, where, where my beginnings with Housing Works came in because um, I was looking for, for some help, you know, uh, I, I got on, uh, you know, public assistance, I applied for social security, I did that kind of stuff. And um, it just ended up, you know, all doubled up until, somebody in a community meeting told, you know, my mother asked the question, like, is there, does anybody know anybody that helps people who are HIV positive and who are homeless? Mm. And um, somebody said, hey, there's a brand new organization called Housing Works, mm. you know? And I, and I walked through Housing Works stores in April, I mean, August of uh, 1991, August, 1991, I walked through their doors. And God rest his soul. The first person I bumped into was Bishop Jeffries. He was uh, another homeless gentleman. He was in the waiting room. And this is the first and only time that this particular line was ever used on me. And he was like, so what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> Go Bishop. Go Bishop. You know, it, it, I, I cracked up. You know, we became fast and hard friends after that, you know, but... Um, it's it's like well you know I'm here for the same thing you are I got nowhere to stay I got a family and I'm HIV positive you know um, I made a decision very early on that I was not going to hide my status that was just I, I it didn't it wasn't even a choice it was just something that happened you know as soon as I came out of that building and I told the kid's father and then I told the father in law and then I told my you know my pet like everybody I was just telling everybody I had I I wasn't I was afraid. Not so much to die, but, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is uh, Val's meds with food. <laughs> it's time for me to take my medication. All right, everybody, take your medication. <laughs> Whoever needs medication time. 7.30, here's my don't HIV cheat, meds. Don't I cheat those pills. I want to see you swallow. Let me see. Watch. Let me see. You good? <clears throat> yep. So That's why... Let me That's ask you something. I used to pop pills like. Did you eat? Did you have to eat with that pill? Did you eat? I, I had a little something. So yeah, I have to I have to have something in my stomach for that. So yeah. So what happened to the women's stories in the dominant narratives? Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? Look, you know, we we know that Carposi sarcoma was, was pretty much put HIV on the map. Um, there were a couple of doctors that realized like, oh, wow, you know, and then, oh, wow. So people are getting this, but they're all, you know, men who have sex, you know, men who have sex with men. And yes, they, they were, you know, at the highest risk and they still remain a very high risk today, including, you know, um, people, you know, trans pe people of trans experience. So that hasn't changed. But one thing that I have always felt, I felt, uh, you know, neglected, I have felt forgotten. And that's not a good feeling. You know, um, it, it hurts, you know, people tell that there was an incident that occurred back in June, that really pissed me off. And, you know, I felt that I was being dismissed by somebody who um, has a, a is pretty much the face of a campaign. That's a worldwide campaign. And it's really a very important thing, you know, and I just felt that this individual was very dismissive in uh, their comments. And it, it really, you know, was something that I took personal. It was like, wait a second, hold on. You, you just pretty much got here the other day. Like you just found out you were positive. When, how long? Has it been a decade yet? Hold on. 
you know, I, I think I've been HIV positive longer than you've been alive, you know, so, um, and, and I think that's, that's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that, yes, we might not have been a giant slice of that pie, but guess what? You are part of that pie and you can't have a whole pie without all those pieces in it, you know? So to be, um, you know, dismissed and ignored is something that really like, don't do that, you know? Um, with, it, you know, as, as, as women, you know, we have tend, we, we, we in our history, right? There's been like so much that that has, you know, we've already had to deal with like, you know, cis white privilege, misogynistic societal dominance, right? And and all this bullshit for thousands of years already. So it's like, yeah, basta, enough, you know. So um, yeah, I'm on a slow burn. It kind of angers me. And you know what? We were part of the narrative then. And we're part of the narrative now. And, you know, the, if we continue the way we're doing, um, yeah, you know, it's going to continue to be the narrative. You know, so um, maybe not in the United States, but, you know, in, in Africa, like the numbers, I mean, listen, I'm not even going to start talking yeah. about numbers or statistics or anything like that. I got a that, couple of numbers. Let me throw in some numbers ahead, because that. I know, look, we got experts out there. Terry, thank you for throwing, um, for typing some resources in the list. And Terry will bring you up first to talk with Val. So uh, get ready. And, um, but here's some numbers for the uninitiated. According to the World Health Organization, over the whole AIDS epidemic is a pandemic, really. Some people call it an epidemic. Some people call it a global, ep global ep epidemic. And I heard Fauci call it a pandemic once. So take a guess, how many millions? Now Churchill says millions don't matter. Well, all that matters is one story, right? But he has 79 million, 79 million infected, 36 million dead, conservatively. They give a range of numbers. These are the bottom numbers. 36 million dead, COVID, 4 million dead, and 222 million cases. Women, just in 2020, 19.3 million women worldwide. Just in 2020, 240,000 women dead to AIDS-related illness. I, you know, the numbers are going to mean nothing, but just keep that in your head. 79 million people ha had HIV and 36 million people died of HIV. I wanna throw in a couple of things and then uh, we'll bring Terry in, okay, Eva? Um, we used to make sex trees. I don't know, what did we call these, Jim? I forget. But I made like a sample of a sex tree that might be something. And so say this is me, say I slept with three people in 1981, let's just say. And then say they each conservatively slept with three people. But then what happens when People who slept with people slept with each other and it gets very complicated, right? And it was, we used to have to draw these things. And then in ACT UP, we had phone trees. So just, I wanna give a two minute, uh, Valerie, I'll tell you a story really quick. So in 1981, I was lucky. Now what happened before 1981? Technologically, we had boom boxes, right? So in 1981, what did they invent? the Sony Walkman with the headphones. So for the first time in the history of New York, I'll just take my experience. Instead of people be bopping with boom boxes and entertaining everybody, everyone's closed in for the first time on the street. And I got diagnosed with a cancer. Now I was lucky because with lymphoma, no one's gonna say, oh, what were you doing? Why'd you get it? It was still called the big C because AIDS wasn't named. So it's not like it was a picnic. You still got looked at, but there was no stigma and everyone wanted me to live. Everyone at Sloan Kettering wanted me to get medicine, surgery, radiation. So I didn't have to fight. We didn't have to organize. So bef while I was in remission, I was in college and um, Val, I don't know, you probably know the story. I ended up going to Egypt. It was a lifelong dream. And I was studying a cancer that had a known cause and effect, and there weren't many. This was bladder cancer that was caused by schistosomiasis, which was caused by people standing in the canals, washing babies, washing dishes, swimming, whatever, right? Mostly quotidian tasks, but there was medicine. So this drove me crazy. Why are people dying when there's medicine? So 
I went to the Egyptian Ministry of Health and I went with a letter in my backpack. I said, here's a letter saying who I am, what I'm studying. So the Egyptian minister told me this, not the minister, some guy in the ministry. His name was uh, Dr. Mustafa. And this is 1985. He said in 1979, so again, just pre, pre-AIDS being named, at the International Conference on Schistosomiasis, he said the Egyptian minister of health in Cairo told a scientist, if you miss the scientist, come up with an immunity pill for schistosomiasis, they call it bilharzia, Sadat will cut off your head. I said, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Don't government want people, want the people of the country to feel good? Don't they want the people? But the bottom line was the peasant class with schistosomiasis had no energy, no ambitions, no dreams. There could have been no Arab Spring without medicine without people having energy to fight. And so when I came back, 1985, 1986, I rode across the country with a a group of 19 queers spreading the word through the Bible Belt that AIDS wasn't uh, sent from God to get rid of the degenerates, because that's what people thought. As soon as we left New York, that's what everybody thought in all rural towns of the Bible Belt. And then I joined ACT UP 1987-ish, and then I met you. And how I got a job there was I was in CBGB and Housing Works was tabling. Nina Herzog was there and I had my resume in my back, backpack. Everything was always in my backpack. And I pulled out my resume and then there was this long interview, 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 interview. And then I thought I was getting a job, but look, I got a lifelong friend. And listen, very few people were as helpful to me as you during COVID because I knew When I called you, I wouldn't have to explain why I was in these four walls with no immune system. I wouldn't, you know, a lot of people said, oh, it'll be over in a month, it'll be over, right? But you knew, listen, 40 years, there's no AIDS vaccine. You know what I mean? All right, let's bring in Terry to get back to the women, women's narrative and AIDS. And and I see people dropping their names, so keep dropping it in. And drop in resources, type in questions, Val, you're getting a lot of comments in the chat. I don't know if you could read it. I gotta, I gotta, yeah, I, I, I have a hard time keeping up with that and trying to do this. Hi, <laughs> Terry. Welcome, Terry. I'm listening to you. Hi, Terry. Hey. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be a panelist today. And hey, tell us what you're working right. on. Terry, what are you working on and what's important? <laughs> so, you know, I dropped in the chat box a interview that Valerie and several other women um did with me a couple of months ago and Valerie I want to talk about it because you just kind of did a quickie on it I think it's really important um that we talk about the fact that women are consistently erased consistently and the situation that Valerie's referring to is um, something that happened on the Today Show in June. They did a story on the 40th anniversary, which of course those of us who know about HIV knows there is no 40th anniversary. This virus has been around much right. longer than that. It's just really recognizing June 5th, 1981 when the CDC released the MMWR report. But one of the things that struck me and struck a lot of women was that on the Today Show, they created this interview panel and it was only men, as if only men got HIV. And it made me furious, it made Valerie furious, Positive Women's Network tweeted about it. And I think it really speaks to the fact that misogyny and sexism is still alive and well, and that you know, when we remove people from these opportunities, it really sends a message to the public that HIV doesn't affect people in their lives. It's the reason why um, women get sick. It's the reason why women are misdiagnosed. And it's certainly the reason why women are dismissed. I mean, just a couple of years ago, Maya Doonesbury wrote a book called Doing Harm, The Truth About 
how bad medicine and lazy science leave women dismissed, misdiagnosed, and sick. And I'd encourage folks to look into that because this is exactly what happens when the Today Show decides to only show the stories of men living with HIV and doesn't include people of, of different gender. And um, Valerie was one of the first people I called and said, I want to talk to you about this. Like, I'm furious. What are your thoughts about this? And how do we stop this from happening? It's not only us being activists mm -hmm. and calling this out or calling this in, but it's also the responsibility of anyone who is ever approached by the press to ask things like this. Who else is going to be on the panel? Is it all white people? Is it all cisgender men? Is it all gay people? Is it all straight people? Have you invited trans people? You know, it's our responsibility to say, I'm not comfortable with this. This is not what my community looks like. And this is uh, not think something I want to be a part of. Or if you want me to be a part of it, um, you need to invite other people and I can give you their names. Or I'm willing to give up my seat so that the right person can be here. And my guess is, that the folks that were involved in the Today Show never said those things. But Valerie, I want you to talk because you were so powerful in the conversation that we had. And I want you to share a little bit more with this audience because you kind of just gave a little snippet, but I think there's more to unpack there. So give her a good question, Terry. Give her, give her the hardball question. Well, good Lord. I. Uh... <laughs> I asked all the questions in my interview. <laughs> um, so okay, so you know, we can watch the interview. With the well, no, you can read it. So you can okay. read it. But I mean, I guess my question to Valerie is: is why do you think this keeps happening, particularly to women in the HIV community? And how can it be stopped? How can we call people in when they do stuff like that? You know, we're kind of moving from this calling out people to calling them in to teach them. Like, all right. So I guess well, that's well, my I, I, I think one of one of the first things we can do is use, um, you know, outlets like this one. We can use Zoom. We can use all kinds of things to to bring to the forefront. You know, what's happened, what's happening, and what we where we wanted to go from here. Right. Um, I I also believe that. You know, we really need to start talking about HIV and AIDS and women and and the whole package because we're not trying to like just diminish anybody. We need to lift everyone up, right? And um, as far as women are concerned, we need to lift ourselves up, one, but we need to be there and lift each other up. You know, whether you're HIV positive, you know, for 40 years like myself, or if you're, you know, just found out you're HIV positive 40 days ago. It's still the same disease. It still caused damage to your body. And, um, you know, we, we need to be able to talk about HIV and AIDS outside of pride because, you know, not only is it a, a it's not a pride related event, you know, HIV has nothing to do with pride, you know, with, uh, with, with gay pride or anything like that. Um, and World AIDS Day is more, you know, I live with, with AIDS every day. So, you know, why do I want to just acknowledge it on that one day? Um, you know, one of the things, you know, talk to your kids, talk to other people. Don't, don't, I, I've always been a big advocate of don't hide that you're HIV positive. You know, it's not something that I'm proud about, but I'm not ashamed of it either. Right. And, um, you know, we've gotten to a place where people were dying and, and like, housing stock back then, the turnaround was so fast because people died. So people were able to get housed quickly. Whereas now that's not the case any longer. Now, you know, the housing stock, it's, it's ridiculous. First of all, the amount that it costs, but to get people housed and to get people, you know, uh, uh, an AIDS diagnosis, thank God we don't have to go through all the crap because a lot of us were around to fight then so that people that are HIV positive now can have these I guess, luxuries, because back then you had to be, uh, you know, you had to have an AIDS diagnosis to even get benefits, whereas now you just have to, I'm HIV positive and that's it, and you're good and you're eligible for stuff, right? Um, we had to fight to just get uh, vaginal yeast infections as part of that list, because, you know, yeah. it was only going by what was happening with men back then, right? And, and I remember like one of the first times that, um, you know, I went anywhere with ACT UP, 
was with um, Jerry Wells, was with Terry McGovern. You know, I believe maybe you had been there. I know a lot of the women that were in ACT UP back in that, at, during that time played a big role in going to, to the CDC and, you know, getting, getting uh, you know, changing the diagnosis and stuff. I, you know, I, I, I still remember my first T cell count, 360. And I have gone down to as low as 37 T cells. And I'm like, right now, I don't know if I have 700, that's a good deal, you know? So, I mean, you know, it, it, it varies. And, and I, I see somebody ask something about, you know, medication and stuff. I've been on medication. I've been taking medication. I've been doing this thing now 30 years straight. But I was taking medication when it was just AZT, when it was C, you know, C3, DT4, you name it, you know, I was the guinea pig. And um, I, I think that we have to make sure that we advocate for ourselves as women. And, you know, we, we really do need to, to just, like you said, you know, bring it up, bring it in. Just like, I, I right. refuse, I refuse. We're bringing, in, we're bringing in more people. Everyone wants to jump, yes, but they're yes. raising their hands and everything. So we might, we might need to do women. another one, Annie. I don't know what to tell you. You know, yes. this is a lot. It's 40 years of this, you know? And this is just one story, geez. All right, we got a lot of chat going on. So pop in Jim or Ivy and um, we got Jenny Schubert out there. Oh, Jenny's here. Jenny, oh maybe we could pop in Jenny, maybe pop in oh. a couple of people. Hi, yeah. Jim. All right, Jim, what do you have to say to this conversation? Got to get unmuted. Throw me the ball. Give me a big kiss, first of Annie, all. throw me the ball. Okay, wait, first we got a kiss. All right. All right, Jim, here you go. I want it high. You oh, got it high, high, baby. Nice, all right. Hi, hey. Hi Ivy, oh. thanks for being here. Um, you asked me a few weeks ago to think about something to talk about. And one of the things I really loved, oh, well, let me, I saw Keith. Thank you for that gorgeous clip. And I ran into the other room. This is what we gave out at Keith's memorial service. Oh, oh my God. So you have a different one, but the same one. Yeah. So, um, a extraordinary man. But I just wanted to, many of you know, five years ago, those of you who are AIDS activists and were in our world know that five years ago, I decided to retire from activism, except this summer, I realized you can't because part of the reason why Terry, Annie and Valerie are such wonderful activists is not because we're angry, it's because we care. I turned 70 last week and I've spent a good deal of the summer learning the exercises that you have to te teach someone who's living with ALS so that they can retain their core functioning as long as possible. I sat in for three and then five sessions. And then I said to the woman, a brilliant uh, occupational therapist, I think the thing I could do to help s someone, you activists out there know most is if I could come in three times a week on the days you don't work and just an hour go through the different exercises but the core exercises, I know early on in ACT UP, the reason we stayed together is because, and, and it's the militancy that gets all the headlines, but it was the love that kept us together. And we were arrested together in affinity groups. And affinity groups wound up being care circles for the people in that affinity group who got sick, who got hospitalized, who became homeless. And so maybe my, this story can't have a neat ending, but it's maybe to, caregiving gets no press because it's thought of as woman's work. 
That's part of the real reason. And yet it is the core of everything in healthcare. And I just wanted maybe to tell everyone out there or encourage everyone out there to say, you can be an activist in your personal life. You can be part of the team that is actually improving the life of, of someone who, who needs it, totally depends on the small village who comes together to take care of someone who's facing a catastrophic illness. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Love you, Jim. Listen, happy birthday too. Oh, yeah. I could use with a fewer, several fewer. Come All right, on. Ivy. What's going on, Ivy? Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So, yeah. um, Hi, I Jesus. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, first, I would like to just say that part of the reason I'm still alive three day kid three day kids after um, after is that um, somebody that was with Jim's. Um, group of activism, the third wave. Uh, I want to honor Sally Cooper, who a lot of us really are here because of her work. Um, she had a huge hand on solving um, available medication for KS, which gave us a huge amount of years to, for those who were lucky enough to, to be um, able to wait for what came down the pipeline. So I just want to thank Sally, who no longer is with us. And unfortunately, hasn't gotten credit from the kind of work she did at the health group. And they, it was incredible work. Um, so Val, you and I met at one of the Katrina's uh, actions, probably the CDC. I don't know why we didn't keep in touch. Um, I, I just think like also women that did not work in AIDS um, community work uh, were left outside and that includes me. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about and um, why we're not there. So I guess I, I've also been guilty about bringing um, Jermichael back <laughs> every time I can at ACT UP. <laughs> Uh, last year, he did a really great teach-in, especially during COVID. Um, and I guess my ass at this moment, because I can't fill all the things that we would like to talk about, is that I would love women that are positive to take space at ACT UP. Uh, ACT UP in itself right now is it's a lot of people that are not positive, not long-term survivors. And that brand of what we achieve it's just a brand right now. And it's important at this moment to do that recollection that as we are written out of history, basically. So some people have put the chat about the Sarah Schulman thing and, and that was really hurtful to have probably in the first five page saying that our long-term positive women were not found and most of them died. And that's just extremely, extremely enraging. Um, and not have Sally part of that story, even though she was not a, a positive woman, but the kind of work she did. Um, and that's really hard. It's really hard to look at ACT UP every year when there's a Women's Day, that they'll put up pictures of the women that were important, but none of them were positive. And it's the same picture of 40 years or 30 years. And to even say to, comrades who say, well, it will be time to put some positive women. And people will say to me after working with them for 12 years, I don't know a positive woman. And that's just enormously hard after working together for 10 years. Um, Ivy, my meat is ticking. Listen, so I got to put, I, I got to ask you okay. a question. Can you type in, I heard there's an upcoming action, Val told me, October, uh, what is it? October 4th or something? For what? So. Uh, What's know, going maybe, on in Texas? Oh, yeah, yeah. Abortion. Yeah. Ivy, maybe you could just type in any, uh, what, you know, people could contact. 
you sure. or, you know what I mean? Whatever, you know? All right. And we just welcome Jenny and Jesus um, to this to this group. And then we'll get Fred in here. Fred's got a poem, I know. But so Jesus and Jenny, let's go to Jesus first. What's going on, Jesus? Where are you? Okay, first I'm adoring you guys. I'm so thankful that somehow the universe just get me here, Valerie and Annie. Uh, I am Jesus Guillem from San Francisco. Uh, I am the founder of the HIV Long Term Survivors International Network. So Valerie, Ose Latino, Inmigrante, uh, HIV 37 años, et cetera, et cetera. I have three questions in one together for you. Oh, for you guys. Uh, first, uh, you know, just a month ago, I still had a woman reaching out in Texas uh, that not even her kids still know that she's HIV positive. And she has a work that is public. So there's still the stigma and discrimination. Uh, also the second part of the question, also Latino, also Latina, Latinx, uh, you know, again, what the message is for our community that kids being diagnosed more and more with HIV and through COVID-19, we don't even know what's going to happen when we check these things. And also, ending this, uh, September uh, 18, of course, is HIV and Asian Awareness Day. We not need to be aware that we're getting, I'm, I'm getting older, uh, but as a woman and getting older also through these things, What's your message with all these three questions together? Loving you guys. I, I would just say that, you know, it's still, there's still a lot of stigma attached to being HIV positive. And the more we talk about it, the more it's in people's consciousness. People, even now with COVID-19, a lot of people that are starting, that, that become positive, don't even want to let people know that they're positive because it's like, oh, well, you apparently were doing something that you shouldn't have been doing, or you were doing somewhere you didn't take care of yourself, which is still pretty much what the stigma is attached to, um, you know, that you're, you're, you're a certain type of individual to be HIV positive. And we need to let people know that no, anybody can get this thing. If you don't do, if you don't take the precautions that are necessary, just because you have PEP and PrEP doesn't mean you're going to be saved. And, um, you know, we, we, we need to, I, I am a big, like, don't, the women that I know, the people that I know that held it in, that didn't tell their families, didn't tell their children, were hiding it, that kills you so much faster than it is to just put it out there. You know, I mean, I, would, I think our fears of what can, what can probably happen, what can possibly happen is worse than the actual reality. You know, and I'm I'm a big proponent, man. Just just put it out there. You don't have to go on a microphone and yell it to the world or where you know get a tattooed on your face or anything. But um, but you're not alone. See, that's that's the most important thing. You're not alone, and that's what I found out. I found out that my village, my tribe, got so much bigger when I talked to other people about it. Whereas if I stayed home and isolated and stayed by myself then you know what, I, was, I wasn't gonna be any good to anybody because I was just all in my head. And that kept me, you know, like using drugs, being out there and, and doing things that weren't going to be healthy for me in the long run. You know, I wasn't expecting to still be around. I was, I was looking at the clock, man. I was like, I was on a timetable. Everybody that I knew was dying, you know? And just the fact that I'm still here and my kids are in their thirties, it's like incredible. I was 30 when I did that video. My kids are past that age now, you know? And, and that to me is like, holy smokes. You know, talk about know planning for the, no planning for the mostly, future. I know this is mostly in English, but a couple of phrases in Spanish for a, for a la nuestra gente. Go ahead, Jesus, say your phrases. And then I want to get Ginny in here. I can't believe Ginny's here. We got to do something in Spanish. Jesus, we'll talk, we'll figure something out, and we'll make it happen. All right, good. So Jesus, put your contact in the chat too, please. Jenny, what's happening? Please make a video, you guys. I I don't have a question for Val. I've known Val for so long. And what I want to do is just honor Val for every other person over this long period of time that she has lifted up. Yes. So that's it. Thank you, Val. Bye. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Jenny, we honor you, Jenny, for everything. 
mm-hmm. lifted up and made it possible for them to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just thinking how my, my daughter might be the only teacher, <laughs> Phoenix Rising, there you go. My daughter might be the only New York City teacher that used to do syringe exchange back in the day. So, you know, yeah, go figure. you never know where you end up, you know? And Val's, oh my gosh. Kids, Val's kids are awesome. <laughs> so as I, I wanna, legacy- before we go to the next one, I just want to give a quick shout out to my family and all my friends yeah. that are out there tonight. You know, my nieces are there, my aunts are around, my cousins. You yes, know, so and I just want to like everyone's gonna be able to turn on their camera right now. Right now. And we're gonna and hear, we're gonna hear some legacy and Fred and then Fred and then and everyone else will be able to uh join in. Legacy, what's going on? What's going on? How you doing? Hi. So Val is my favorite person in the whole wide world. Except for, and, for our wife. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know. But I just want to say, like, I'm here just like Jenny. I just need to give you your flowers. A lot of who I am and who I've become today is because you, you've been a pioneer. You stepped out the way so that other people can become and grow and be that. I came into Housing Works, lost all over the place, rambunctious, a lot of energy, didn't know how to navigate it. And you took it and you turned me into one of the most powerful advocates in New York City. And I was able to grow wings from that. I went from being homeless to having my own home because you never let me doubt myself. You done the work, so you taught me how to do it so that the generation after me, I can teach them too. I've graced covers. I've been on TV. I've been in magazines in places where people didn't want me to go. But every time they tried to throw the key across the fence, you went across the fence to go get it and unlock the door. So I am very grateful for all of the things that you have done. You trusted me with some of your most precious things, your granddaughter, to guide her when because you thought that I had it. So I just want anybody who's ever had the energy that Val has given out, like this woman, I am so glad that you are here to be able to teach this little girl boy on how to be great. So thank you so, 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 so much. You are thank you phenomenal. Nice. Did you remember to ask her who that person was? Uh, everyone, no, Rick, you mute yourself, yourself if you're not talking. I'm getting to find it. Legacy, we'll thank you, Legacy. Val, I hope you're taking in all of this, Val. So listen, Fred's here. Fred, I know you got a poem for us. We yes, are right. uh, you know, we were going to link COVID and it. I'm getting an echo. Go ahead, Fred. Let us hear your poem. Okay, this is a poem I wrote for a friend of mine who died of COVID. It's called Remembering Tom. You've been gone for over one year now. I'm Italian, so I knew something was wrong when you were not answering my texts or commenting on the jokes and funny stories. I was sending you on your phone and Facebook. I Googled your name with the word obituary next to it. And of course it came up. It said you died after fighting COVID for seven days at only 53 years old. I wanted to know details, but there was no one I could ask. I did not know your family, so I could not contact them. All I knew was that your elderly parents and brother lived in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and your sister in Midland Park, New Jersey. You worked at Sharp Electronics with the husband of one of my former colleagues, but he had already retired. So what was I going to do? Call them out of the blue and ask them for details about what happened? I remember how you criticized how I drove, how poorly I cared for my car. You believed I had too many investment accounts and should not use a financial planner to oversee them. You wanted me to take charge of them myself so I would not be charged any commissions. I explained to you over and over 
that there was only one thing I knew how to do well. That was how to teach languages. I do well what I do well, and you do well what you do well. So unless you were volunteering to take over the job, I would continue to manage my finances as I always have, with the aid of a financial planner. I miss our dinners together, even though you would comment on how I always ordered salmon or mashed up some of my food before I ate it, and, and how things in my house were often out of, out of place. To tell you the truth, Tom, I would often leave them that way on purpose, just to see what you would say. Although I sometimes found the things you said annoying, I also saw the truth and humor in them, and I would laugh at them. I wish you were still here so we could go out for another nice dinner, and I could hear you say the things that annoyed me, and I could laugh at them all over again. Tom, thanks for our friendship of almost 20 years, and as my, as my favorite television hosts from childhood, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans would always say at the close of their weekly show, happy trails to you until we meet again. I enjoyed our ride together. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Thanks, You're Fred. Welcome. Thanks, Fred. Thanks for the chance to read. I see we have Mark Harrington out there. Mark, what's going on? Hey, everybody. I just can't believe how amazing it is to hear and see all of you tonight. And I'm feeling a lot of love and humility and gratitude for all of you starting at the top. And I just put some of your names into the chat. But it does me a lot of good to see to see everyone all together after 30 or 40 years of activism and after the last two terrible, after five years of Trump and the last two terrible years. So I just want to thank you all and send you all my love. Well, I want to thank you, Mark, Ginny, and, and, you know, all the pioneers, because when COVID hit, all the AIDS activism teachings, Jim, all helped me survive this year as immunocompromised. I thought harm reduction, close my eyes, co cover a couple of masks when I'm going to get the mail. Everything I, everything I learned back there from you guys, you women, you plural, that's what helped me survive every day. And of course, Val, who I could call and say, ah, these are my, it's me in these walls. Shayla, what do you have to say, Shayla? I'm looking at Shayla and Kimberly. Shayla, what's going on? Hey, hey hi, how are you? Hi, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you for you know creating this safe space to have a very important conversation. And I was born in 89 and grew up in the 90s. So I often heard about HIV and AIDS, um, but conversations were not always had in a very healthy way. You know, there was always um, uh, language like the package or Batman forever, you know, where it was very desensitized. Wait, hold but, on. Batman? Can you say that again? The Batman forever. What does that mean? Meaning like someone who has been diagnosed with HIV. Um, that's is is to describe like this is their sentence. So they're living with the Batman forever, which I thought was very cruel. And I never repeated and I never thought was funny. Um, so I say all that to say that I am happy for the activism around um, this pandemic because it's exactly what it is. Um, and I am also happy that I do have a mentor, um, an older man, Lewis Farmer, um, and he talks candidly about his diagnosis whenever I go to visit. You know, it's always at the top of the line. Um, and he's making sure that there's also education and he's checking in too, regardless of our gender and sexuality about, you know, how are we maintaining and balancing healthy relationships? Um, and a lot of times it's not just always about sex, but it's really about having these conversations that are necessary in order to, how can I say, in order to, to save the knowledge that we have and to pass on. Um, and for me at 17, I started very early going for testing because of 
the misinformation and the level of fear and the level of hatred that people had to the point where it created anxiety for me. And I was like, wow, this is something I have to take very serious. Um, and I am now 31 and I still do the same, you know, uh, every three to six months, the same thing. Um, it is a part of my regular PCP checkup. It is very important. It is here. Our people are here. I'm here. And so this is what we have to take into consideration in order to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shayla. Uh, Evelyn, Valerie uh, is called shouting you out, Evelyn. Tell us, tell us who you are. And then Hi. Kimberly, and then uh, and then I'll say them. <laughs> All right, Evelyn, am, what's going on? I am her oldest niece. <laughs> I live in North Carolina. And she's my one of my favorite, favorite titis in the whole world. I love you. I miss you. Miss <laughs> you too. And who's there with you, Evelyn? My sister-in-law, my sister. <laughs> Hi, Zelina. I'm Zelina. I married into the family and Titi Valerie took me in like her very own and I love her. And we're so proud of you. Too. And it has been an honor hearing everybody talk about her and praise her. And I am so proud to say that she's my family. She's amazing. And I love you, Titi. I love you guys so much. I miss you. I gotta Miss take a too. trip down south. I, yes, I, ma'am. I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> Thank you both. All right, Kimberly and Jen. I'm sure Jen's got something to say. I just uh, hi everybody. I'm just um, I'm just really happy to be here, and I'm so happy this kind of emerged in my inbox, and that I tuned in, and I wanted to just uh, lift up Valerie. I feel like I, you know, I didn't know you in that first chapter that was uh, uh, portrayed in the video. Um, I have only known you in this second round just as good. And uh, I just am honored to know you and to have worked alongside you. And you are often like uh, uh, a quiet but fierce, steady force. <laughs> Sometimes in the background, not always, but uh, I tend to like to stay in the background. So I, I always appreciate those of us who like to be the steady force in the back. Um, and it's just really, it's just amazing to hear you all and see so many activists that I've looked up to for my whole career. I, I am now, I'm about to be 54 in a couple of weeks and I have done, my whole career has been in this work and I'm deeply committed to it. Though sometimes I, you know, you feel a little like you get removed, uh, you feel a little, disconnected. Um, maybe COVID has uh, uh, sort of helped that along, but I'm just really happy to be here and so uh, happy to, to see all of you and I love you all and thank you, Valerie, for being you. Here. Thank you, Kimberly. Listen, um, before we go on, I want to, um, I want to, for people who need to leave, just because the media, look, the media, you see the expired? Oh. I'm going to take Val, it, Annie. <laughs> Val, this meter is always reminding me that, uh, you know, I got this moment and that's it. But yeah, I gotta, gotta, you need a quarter. Hold on. Anybody got a quarter? <laughs> yeah, anybody got a quarter? Val, you got a quarter? Not on me, no. Molly, can you come back? Molly, Shayla, you got a quarter? Oh, oh there, there goes, go. there goes. Oh, uh, she got a uh, bunch Molly, of quarters. Give me, give me. Got a quarter. <laughs> All right, you I got, got it. Quarter. So listen, so let's do a, a moment because listen, it's 29 years ago tonight, Valerie held Papo. So let's take a moment to, before we go on, and then for whoever's got to leave, thank you for being here. Uh, let's remember some people and Papo being number one. And Valerie, thank you for letting us gather tonight on uh, this anniversary. Well, I, I want to thank City Law for, for allowing this opportunity to even happen, you know, um, it's, it's great and I'm, I'm grateful to, to even have this platform to talk about these things. But I don't just want to remember people who just passed away who have died from AIDS and AIDS, uh, HIV and AIDS complications. I also want us to, to take a moment for all the people that we've lost so quickly, you know, during COVID. Um, I don't know how it's been for a lot of folks, but I know that, you know, in the beginning of the HIV pandemic epidemic, you know, there were just so many people dying so quickly. And I, you know, I feel like I've been re-traumatized and kind of like going through all of this all over again, because 
we've lost so many people. I, I, I can't, I've lost count. I don't know how many times we've checked in in the mornings during work and, you know, yet somebody else had passed away or somebody else has died or this week there's another memorial. So it's, it's let's take a moment to, to, to honor and remember um, those people, everyone. So we, we could not all, those people. I'll take that no, back. So we, we cause I'm all, one of those people. Let's all say a few names. <laughs> so Val, you start Val. Jose Vicente Jimenez. All right, I'm going to bring oh, I in... think everybody's on mute. They can't say anything. <laughs> they can unmute themselves. Well, I'll call on people so it's not cacophony. So Rosalind Davis, go ahead, Val. She was in our, first of all, the most beautiful Rosalind. She was in our writing group at Housing Works. And Valerie reminded me of this sentence she wrote that we taped up on the wall. Go ahead, Val, give it a read. Death is so final, so final is death. I never forgot that line when she wow. said that, like, when Rosalind wrote this line in that writing workshop, I said, wait, 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 wait we got to put this up on the wall. Listen to this, pure poetry. Forget John Donne and the rest of them. Death is so final, so final is death. Rosalind Davis. And I remember, there's and this is so credit many. to Housing there's, Works, Ginny. There's so many you know, names. Rosalind told me, I'm dying with the key in my hand, you know, to an apartment. And that was my goal, you know. And we all wore keys back then at Housing Works, the big plastic keys, keys with a big emblem. And uh, so Rosalind Davis. All right, G, uh, I, let's see. Hey Zeus, you're holding up a sign, I see. Yeah, I just wanna mention Esther Savignon and to all of you, you are not invisible. You're never invisible. But Val, back to you. Oh my gosh, I, I like, there's just so many. Maybe we should just take a moment of silence or something instead of like trying to remember and put everybody's name out there or uh, because it's a little weird with. Let's do both. Let's do some names and then we'll do some boxes. silence. Go ahead, Val. Can Keep people silent. unmute themselves? There's, well, there's Coco Wee. There's Norma. There's, oh my gosh, there's car wash. There's like so many people. I can't even begin to remember everybody's names. John Mincy, Keith Silo, right on your chest. Patricia Hall just passed away a week ago. Um, oh man, so sad. That's good. Just call it out. I think that's, that's good. a lot of names. Amy hey, Mixon, Wayne Phillips. I got Tommy D'Alessandro. And of COVID, Pauline Ercolano. Phyllis Sharp. Essex Hemphill, great poet, beautiful poet. Wow. Uh, um, yeah. My cousin DJ. That's Mike Ruiz. My wife's dad, Michael Medina. Ray Navarro, great artist. Isha. John Byrne, Charles Ludlam. Ethel Eichelberger, Riesel, Riza Abdo, Harry Condolian. Uh, downtown arts were kind of decimated. We got some names in the chat. Um, Cliff Goodman, Felicia Flames, Hector Padilla, Sandra Vreeland. Carmelita's in the house. <laughs> Hi, Carmelita. There's a lot of names in the chat. Hilda Melor, Joanne Walker, Deshaun Isom, Peter Qua. Come, Mark, why don't you just come say these names? Mark's got a bunch of people. Well, yeah, Jim unleashed a, a, a flood yeah. of memories. Uh, the photographer, Peter Hujar, the artist, Paul Tech, the artist, David Wanarovich. Uh, my ex-lover, J. Kevin Funk, and thousands and thousands of other people whose names would take all night. Ivy put Michael Cowan. Thank you, Ivy. You know, we, we still have those notebooks. We have a drawer full of notebooks, full of names that we used to read for 24 hours for uh, during World AIDS Day for 24 consecutive hours nonstop. Not one person on a mic, but like five people on a mic simultaneously reading names for 24 freaking hours. 
Imagine if we did something like that for COVID too. Forget about it. We'll be here for the next 20 years. Remember when we did it for the governor? Took all of our books to Albany and read the names there. And, and, and we had to walk up the million dollar staircase. And we was just like a big booming echo throughout the whole Capitol building. It was great. Jennifer, hi. I miss you. Hi, I miss you too. <laughs> it's nice to be able to see you. So I have the I have the great uh, honor and pleasure of working with Valerie and Jenny every day at Housing Works, except not this week because I'm away. Um, so this is the first time I've seen you in, in six whole days. Uh, I love you, <laughs> Valerie. Um, there's so many people on. Annie, thank you for hosting this amazing uh, evening. It's lovely to see so many people I love and admire on this call. And Valerie is right at the top of that list. Um, you know, bringing up the names makes me think of a, a friend of mine who uh, passed away several years ago, and um, I still feel strange saying his name because his family was not allowed to know uh, in this day and age, um, and he was pretty much all alone except for his ex-partner, which is how I knew him, um, and I don't think his parents to this day know that he passed from AIDS-related causes, um, and Valerie, what you said before really resonated with me about um, you know, speaking up and speaking out. And you're such a beautiful example of that. And I get to see that every day. Um, one thing I know we talk about a lot at work that I just wanted to throw at you if you feel like answering a question is, um, you know, how in the last couple of years with the pandemic, we all of a sudden, the governor and the mayor have discovered this thing called racial, racial health care inequity. And it's very shocking to them and it's brand new. Um, and uh, they, they discovered it. My husband's laughing in the background. Uh, and, and we all know, and, and you know, Valerie, that's, that's not right. Um, so I was wondering if you wanted to speak on that for a minute. And I love you so much. I love you too. Yeah, I, I, I just learned the, uh, the theme for the New York City World AIDS Day event, and it's got to do with uh, health equity and, and building health equity and stuff. And, Look, the bottom line is this, there's no such thing as equity, period. It just doesn't exist. It's, it's something that you can, PC, political correctness. There's nothing political, nothing correct about it. It is what it is. People that need the healthcare aren't, being, aren't able to access the healthcare. People that you know, need the medications, people that need, it's just like, who, who, who the hell are they kidding? You know, who, I mean, seriously, come on. You can't kid a kidder and, and it's just frustrating. You know, wow, kudos, you, you guys, um, they, they, they uh, discovered something, wow. They need to keep coming back. <laughs> they need to listen to a lot of us, you know. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Let us do it, let us do our job. Just give us the money so we can do what the hell needs to get done. Because you know who stepped up during, during this crisis, it wasn't Cuomo. Cuomo was just talking, it was a mouthpiece. All he did was like to hear himself speak for an hour every freaking day for over a year. You know, whereas well, while he was just running his mouth, you know, there's a lot of people in this that I'm looking at right now, a lot of the names that are that are on the screen that actually were doing the work. And um, the people that stepped up, you know, during COVID for AIDS activists. And why? Because we knew what we went through already. We knew what we had to do. We didn't have to forge anything new. We just knew we had to kick some ass and we had to make sure that people listened. And that's still what we're doing. And we're still going to have to do it. That's not going to stop. So there goes, that's, that's the equity. If there was equity, there'd be no reason for any of us to be here talking about any of this stuff today. Yeah, we only, you know, we, we way past our time. So I'm like, yeah. Get me started. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, um, you know, in this moment that we're going through two pandemics and talk of me, talking about decades of uh, activism and, and this platform, um, well, you know, I think it's important to, to maybe close this way in terms of the energy that we've worked through this years is that we have Mark Harrington here who, when we say um, that we have a vaccine, COVID vaccines, that Mark and Greg, um, when people say it's AIDS activists, but, but it actually, two human beings um, and one being in this chat was the reason we have a vaccine center in the NIH and how incredibly 
important and life changing that is. Um, so I just want to say thank you to, to Marcus here today. That is not just an AIDS activist, it's actually somebody, our friend that is out here that's responsible to, to put, you know, putting that in the NIH and that we can see a vaccine for COVID. Um, people forget that. So thank you, Mark. Ivy, I would be derelict if I didn't um, say that there were there were hundreds of every, everything that the AIDS activists did that led to the foundation of the Vaccine Research Center at, at the NIH in the late 90s was was powered by the, the power of ACT UP and Housing Works and all the other groups that came from it. And we were just the ones that, at the tip of that particular spear. But earlier, you know, when people were talking about harm reduction, that was what Housing Works and the Needle Exchange were doing. And CDC Action, that's what, you know, a, a different group of people in ACT UP was, was doing. And we, we should all own the victories, they're all shared. And the losses, of course, were all shared as well. You know, be, before we, we end wrapping this up, I just want to give a quick shout out, you know, there to Alden McKean. You know, he, he was the one that, um, he was the first person that I ever heard use the term long-term survivor. And this was uh, in 1992 when I heard it for the first time. And as soon as I heard those words come out of his mouth, I had to turn to, to Keith and ask like, what the hell is that? What does that mean? And as soon as I understood what it meant, I made a decision like at that moment, it was like, I'm going to be one of those long term survivors. Mm -hmm. You know, little did I know that he hadn't been living with the virus like all that long. But um, yeah, Alden. <laughs> Val, one thing you say to me is survival is a full time job. It is. It is a full time job. I mean, if you don't even have it, just just trying to, to stay sane nowadays is a full-time job. Just trying to get through a day is, is a full-time job. So yeah, yeah. It's survival of the fittest, but it's not, like if it was survival of the fittest, forget it, I'd have been gone, right? But it's, it's, it's survival in terms of mindset and, you know, what you put out there, what you put out there, your energy, your aura, whatever it is you want to call it, you know, whatever it is that you put out, that's what you're going to get back, man. You put shit, you get shit, right? You you put good stuff, you put good, strong, positive stuff out there, then you're going to get good, strong, positive stuff back. You know, I've always said, you know, I'm a positive woman in many aspects and in many ways, right? And people always wonder, like, what does that mean? I was like, well, keep coming around, hang out with me, we'll, you know, we'll find out and, you know, maybe you'll get to kind of know what, what that means, you know, but, and there's Michael King, hi, Mike, <laughs> so good to see you, <laughs> he's the only person I know that in the middle of an action, people getting arrested, to demonstrate a demo, he can sit back against the pillar, sit up straight, close his eyes and meditate, man, it's like, wow, <laughs> How do you do that? You know. How do you do that, Michael? What's your, uh, <laughs> what do you do? You're hey. unmuted, but we can't hear you. Uh, you yeah, sometimes you just need some quiet in the middle of it, and I think it's the spiritual force of the protests. You know, sometimes I feel filled up by that people's love, people's uh, dedication. You know, it's all there and. Valerie has led things for so long in such a beautiful way. Really beautiful to hear everything tonight. Michael, what do you say to yourself in that, like to take that quiet moment? You know, like what's, uh, what do you say to yourself? <clears throat> I, you know, I don't do it all the time, but sometimes it just, it feels right. It feels right. And I feel like I'm guided by the collective participation. It's not a me thing. Mm. It's like sometimes the force of the group, mm. just like, you know, steers me to do that. It just seems like the right thing. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's funny. It's true, Val. You know, it's, it's weird sometimes, but uh, I'm glad to be able to do that. Plus, you're going to be in jail for a long time. So like getting a little rest for a little while is always good. <laughs> wow. Uh, Val. Yeah. You know how much I love you. And, you know, People that don't know, Annie, Annie's my Sunday babe. 
Annie's my Sunday babe. Where, where'd my work wife go? She left. Okay. <laughs> I've got a I've got a side chick at work. Oh no, no, my work wife. Hi. I've got my side chick. I heard I that. she's here tonight. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, man. Everybody, everybody that I'm looking at right now has played a, a, a big impact, not just on my life, and well, yeah, played a big role in my life at some point, you know, and um. I couldn't have done any of this without any of y'all. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for all of your work and all of your activism and everything that you do and everything that everybody brings to the table. You know, we just got to keep creating tables. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> we just got to, there's not a table. Let's make one then. Let's go. I think we've all gotten good at making tables <laughs> or just pulling up a chair, whether they invite us or not. So. <laughs> Well, let's stay, think, stay let's fierce, think, uh, Val. Let's take Michael's uh, group energy meditation moment. And um, I just want to say um, I love and admire you all and have loved and admired many of you for decades. Um, Valerie, you're at the top of the list in my heart. And um, and. Uh, if this mRNA vaccine pans out, we'll have an HIV vaccine. <clears throat> you know, if it takes 40 years or more, who knows? So I'm gonna hold this whole collective, you know, in my heart right now. And uh, Evelyn down south. Evelyn, when I'm in Manhattan, I'll give Val a hug for you, okay? And, um, do. Thank you. And, you know, maintain your strength. There's an old Italian saying I like to call on. It's not Italian. It's uh, Basilicatese, which is in the heel of the, in the arch of the heel of the boot. Maintain it to fort come una ciresetta pesat. You got that, Jim? Maintain your strength like a hot cherry pepper. And you all got that, that's for sure. So Valerie, I'll talk to you and let's all keep loving and talking to each other and thank everybody. Ivy, thank everybody for coming. Jenny, everybody, Mark. Marcelo. Thank you. We love you. Bye, thank love you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, City Lore. <laughs> all right.